Welcome back to Dr. Finance. This is a paper written by Lawrence Klein, who won the Nobel Prize in Economics in 1980. This is what he published in Econometrica 1947, titled The Use of Econometric Models as a Guide to Economic Policy. It is desirable to provide tools of analysis suited for public economic policy that are, as much as possible, independent of the personal judgments of a particular investigator. Econometric models are put forth in this scientific spirit because these models, if fully developed and properly used, eventually should lead all investigators to the same conclusions, independent of their personal whims. The usual experience in the field of economic policy is that there are about as many types of advice as there are advisors, sometimes even more. Statistical models of the working of the economy, economy are not proper, uh, proposed as uh, magic formulas which divulge all the secrets of the complex real world in a single equation. The statistical models attempt to provide as much information about future or other unknown phenomena as can be gleaned from the historical records of observable and measurable facts. To the extent to which people maintain their past behavior patterns in the future, the statistical models provide information about the quantitative properties of economic variables in the future. However, econometricians do not operate in a vacuum. They, their methods are not purely mechanical in the sense that they do not think they do nothing but substitute in formulas. Any information of a qualitative nature that is available should be used by the econometrician in drawing inferences about the real world from his model. For example, suppose that an econometrician is called upon to forecast next year's level of employment, and suppose further that this econometrician knows that war will break out next year. Would the econometrician merely substitute into this equations of peacetime behavior patterns in order to forecast employment in a period during which there will be war? Obviously, any qualitative information, for example, the outbreak of war next year, must be taken into account in order to make a proper forecast. Non-statistical economist has only qualitative information from which to make judgments. The statistical economist has this same qualitative information plus a thorough knowledge of historically developed behavior patterns. Hence, it may be said that the latter is better equipped types of policies. The ideas that grew out of the discussion of the full employment bill showed clearly the close relationship between forecasting and economic policy. As the bill was originally drafted, it called for a periodic forecast of the deflationary or inflationary gap. A predicted deflationary gap would call for one type of policy and a predicted inflationary gap for another type of policy. Thus, the first step in carrying out the provisions of the bill is to make a forecast. The success of a public policy will depend virtually, uh, vitally, on the, vitally on the accuracy of the forecast. An important use of econometric models, as will be demonstrated below, is to make forecasts. A second step in the implementation of a full employment bill is to wipe out the forecasted deflationary or inflationary gap. This step will also have to be quantitative. How much employment will be created by an X percent cut in taxes? By how much will prices be expected to rise if government expenditures rise by a known amount with constant tax rates? There are these are only a sample of the types of questions that must be answered in order to decide among alternative policies. 
It is evident that the answers to such questions depend upon consumer and business spending saving behavior habits. The statistical approach is to examine the spending saving habits of past periods in order to get some idea of the pattern of future habits. Suppose that the population's habits are going to change in a known way. We may want to know the effects of this change upon the entire system. If we have econometric models, we can often predict the results of such changes. The example can easily be given if it is known that the introduction of a, so a social security program will raise the marginal pro propensity to consume by Y% percent because people will be more certain of the future. The quant quantitative effects of the program can be estimated in advance from statistical models. The estimate may very well be so, uh, will have some influence on this decision whether or not to adopt the social security scheme. A similar use of models arises in the study of the effects of technological change. A change in the technique of production can often be translated into an exact quantitative change in some of the param parameters of the production pro function that has been statistically determined from data which referred to in the old process of production. It is possible to calculate the change in several relevant variables of the system such as employment, output, wages, prices, etc. As a result of the technological change provided we have an appropriate econometric model. On the basis of the limited number of observations available for testing different economic models from which to form policy decisions, it is not yet possible to select an unique, a unique model. More than one model are consistent with the observations. In this paper, we shall present three plausible models and methods of forming policy will be studied with each alternative. The reader is free to choose among the models, all of which rest on different hypotheses. Other models, in addition to these, uh, those presented here, have also been studied by the author, but they are not demonstrated in order to avoid repetition. The usefulness of econometric models. Those engaged in this construction of econometric models know only too well the limitations on these models. The ranges of error associated with forecasts at reasonable probability levels are larger than will be required for many problems. In several cases, we shall find that the plus-minus bands of error include both inflation and deflation, or yes and no. That part of the error associated with sampling fluctuations can be improved upon. We can get more data and better data, both of which give additional information and help to establish the parameters of the system with a greater degree of accuracy. For example, if we could get good quarterly observations for all series used in this paper over the entire interwar period, we should have more information from which to est estimate the parameters of the system. There would not be four times as much information, but there would be much more information. It is, of course, important to know what we cannot do in order that we do not fool ourselves. But our results are not purely negative. They show clearly in this paper that the probability is high that national product will fall in the latter part of the present fiscal year. These forecasts can be made in spite of the fact that the range of error is fairly wide, say 10 or 15 billion dollars. From model two, we deduce that deficit spending has a higher multiple 
uh, multiplier effect than is the case for an easy money policy. This deduction follows in spite of the fact that the parameters of the model are subject to considerable error. In the recent past, fiscal 1946 and calendar 1946, model 3 has shown that there would probably be an inflationary gap rather than deflationary gap. Not only was this forecast definite, but it was also correct. Even if a forecast from a model includes that joint probabilities of inflation and deflation, the forecast may be very useful in policy formation. Suppose that a particular value of GNP called GNP0 um, represents neither inflation nor deflation. Suppose further that the forecast is that GNP will be in the range of minus epsilon sub 1 plus GNP of one, uh, 0, comma, GNP 0 plus epsilon 2, sub 2, right, with high probability P0. If zero, uh, if, if epsilon one is greater than zero and epsilon two is greater than epsilon one, there is a greater chance for inflation than for deflation. Government agencies that are prepared to combat inflation should be given greater powers than the agencies that are prepared to combat deflation. Although both agencies should be given some powers because there is a possibility that either one may be needed. In the other case where epsilon 2 is greater than 0 but is smaller than epsilon 1, the greater power should be given to the anti-deflationary agency. <clears throat> In both examples, the amounts to be given each type of agency will depend upon the exact sizes of epsilon 1 and epsilon 2. But the principle of action is obvious. <clears throat> the above type of policy is applicable only in the case in which the cost of prefer preparing for inflation or for deflation or for both are negligible. If there is a cost attached to the carrying out of policies such as the cost of Advert, uh, cost of diverting resources to precautionary government activities. A different type of calculation must be made. If the cost of preparing for inflation when the true situation is deflation, the cost of prepa preparing for deflation when the true situation is inflation, and the cost of preparing for the correct situation are known in advance, it is also possible to advise the government on a correct choice of alternative policies even though the forecast interval covers both inflation and deflation simultaneously thanks for listening